welcome to Brampton Focus. Currently in the world, national security and defense are top of mind. The current Liberal government is going across Canada, conducting town hall meetings to find out what Canadians want from their military. My name is Michael A. Charbonne. Next, we meet Ruby Sahota, a member of Parliament for Brampton North, and we will discuss the Canadian military, right here on Brampton Focus. Welcome back to Brampton Focus. Our guest today is Miss Ruby Sahota. She's a member of Parliament for Brampton North. Ruby, thank you so much for joining us at Brampton Focus. Thank you for having me. Uh, in July, uh, Ruby, you held a town hall discussion uh, in Brampton, which was part of the, the government's uh, public consultation on developing new defence policies. Uh, the Trudeau government, uh, after reviewing the whole Canadian defence policy, uh, has delayed more than $3.7 billion of money that was going to be spent over the next five years. Uh, now, you were at uh, Legion Branch 15 in uh, Brampton North. One could say that that's not necessarily the hub of military um, optics for Canada. But with that said, um, what do you believe is a key role for Canada in our defense, uh, particularly in our, nor in our northern borders where the Arctic is being challenged? Well, uh, first I'd like to uh, defend my riding in the city of Brampton <laughs> because there is, you know, there's a lot of intelligence. There was a lot of intelligence around in that round table that day. We have a lot of vets. We have um, companies, manufacturers that are interested and linked with uh, military policy. And uh, we had a gentleman all the way that flew in from Winnipeg, uh, from Magellan to come to the round table. So there was quite a lot of interest here in Brampton. And um, I've got to say, we have a lot of fine men, men and women that have either served or are serving in our mm -hmm. military here. So it was very important to hear them out. And that's what the government is doing. They're committed to having open consultations. I'm sure it's a word that you're quite, you know, you've been hearing a lot of. Lately. I wasn't meant to slide your writing. <laughs> It's just a comment. You would think, but uh, obviously, I mean, uh, some of the things that you said we talked before we uh, we came on, uh, there was a lot of interesting comments. But back to the salient point with regards to protecting our borders. We've had challenges from the Russians. We've had challenges in, in our northern sector of the Arctic. Can you lend to us some of the things that you've learned or some of the some of the positions you believe your government is going to take to defend our northern corridor? Well, I'd, I'd like to focus more on the roundtable. The purpose of the roundtable was so that we could get input from uh, people that are involved either with the military or that have some interest in the military. Mm -hmm. And what the feedback that we received from them uh, was that it was definitely a, a key issue, just like you're mentioning. It's an issue of concern to Canadians. Uh, we want to be able to protect our resources. And that's what uh, I think, you know, most of the people focused on the northern part being a resource, uh, the waters being a resource for us and for us to protect it for that mm -hmm. and the climate change that we're facing up there. Um, we talked a little bit about our approach perhaps having been reactive rather than proactive up in the north so that's a you know a shift we may have to make but the purpose of these consultations is to figure out which direction we're going to head in there hasn't been consultations of this magnitude or a policy review done in over 20 years so it's about time um, i know all the policy buffs out there are really excited about it but so are the average people as well because we do need to do uh, make decisions based on some scientific evidence and based on consultations with our people. And yes, you know, I say, yes, it's a key priority and the key area for us to figure out what we do in. Do we put a lot more resources in there? I don't know. Or do we train our troops that are there currently in a different way to deal with the climate change, to deal with the issues that may be uh, the threats that we may be facing in the future? I think that's probably where the focus needs to be. We may be need to change the way we operate there. You you mentioned about uh, how many years it's been. It's almost been since 1964, since we really had a good sharp look at our military spending. And I mean, that, that spans both parties, all three parties, any parties that have been in power have been lacking. When you look at current statistics that state about 65,000 active troops in the Canadian Armed Forces, mm -hmm. about 25,000 in reserve. And when we look in Ottawa, there's over 20,000 people who are working in the higher ups part of the part of that discussion does it not speak to uh, reviewing some of the senior non-commissioned officers compared to the junior commissioned officers and putting more money that is on the desks on the decks of ships as one would say 
Um, this concern was raised at our round table as well and uh, about having more, actually about recruiting more men and women into the military. Uh, now whether we have, you know, too many people in, on the bureaucratic side and in the civil service side of uh, the military uh, in comparison to the actual, you know, uh, troops, that is something that needs to be looked at. I mean, now, I mean, the purpose of us doing this is so that in, later in July, when we sit down, when I sit down with the Minister of Defense, right. I can bring these issues of concern. Are you going to other locations as well? Uh, no, I'm focusing on my riding. Other MPs will be going to other locations. There's also a defense committee that's been doing and uh, looking at this. And so what's the most somewhere. important takeaway with about two minutes left here? The most important takeaway that you got from your roundtable? I know you're going to file a report and we'll be able to review it in detail. Is there one point that really resonated with you? Um, I, you know, we talked a lot about the reserves and also the, you know, the difference in uh, how, how the reserves function in comparison to uh, the regular troops, the Canadian Armed Forces. I think that was a big concern around the table, but it may have been because of uh, we had a lot of reservists there. Mm -hmm. um, having people that are currently in the reserves or in the armed forces that are not or sitting by idly i guess i don't mean that as any kind of a knock i mean it more so that we can keep them they want to be engaged and of they course. want to stay active and uh so i think that is, important backup I they're mean. they're incredibly important so i think that may be a, a quite a large concern because we want to make sure that we keep recruiting into the military and that has been dwindling so i would see see that as a, as a key concern we need to make sure not that we're just spending, but that we have the proper men and women that we need in our armed services. 65,000 active forward. troops enough for us, do you think? I mean, considering we're a 35 mm. million uh, population, we're, I mean, from what we're seeing coming up, we're going to be expected to do more peacekeeping. 65,000 troops, I, I don't know what the military term is, uh, but it, it, it's not a lot. Um, it, it, it isn't a lot. We have been operating, I think, with a, a low number. But, and also, we plan on being more active in the future. That's what I do yeah. see from our government. Uh, we are more involved, whether it is in a peacekeeping role mm -hmm. or whether it's in a more um, direct combat role. We don't know what the future holds, and that's something that we've discussed heavily as well, our changing global world that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the threats of terror and uh, what our involvement should be ahead of time in certain parts of the world to make sure that we don't end up in a horrible situation. So, and how much Canada, uh, you know, needs to step up and make sure that uh, that we're present on that world scale, uh, world level. And, and I think we have been doing it. Our allies are quite happy, whether we've changed our role in the Middle East to be a little bit different. I, we can see it from when Obama visited Ottawa and the words he said in his speech that, you know, Canada is, we, the world needs more of Canada. I'm going to stop you there. Uh, when we come back, we're going to continue our discussion with Ms. Ruby Sahoda from Brampton North. We're talking about the military. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about peacekeeping and some of the objectives that the Liberals have put out for us and Canada and some of the challenges that we have to meet. You're watching Brampton Focus. My name is Michael A. Sharp. Ball, and we're sitting here with this Ruby Sahola, Member of Parliament for Brampton North. Back right after this. Brampton Focus, our guest today is Ms. Ruby Sahoda from Brampton North. Uh, she held a really a cool round table in July uh, speaking about military reform. Again, we thank you uh, for coming back to us here at Brampton Focus. Um, so we'll jump right back into this. this is our second segment and the second segment that we're talking about the military. Former Chief uh, Defense uh, Staff Rick Hillier, who we all remember, stated that the Liberals wanted to redeploy soldiers on a peacekeeping uh, mission with the United Nations. And to do so, you need equipment capable of withstanding long periods of deployment that have enough placement replacements in case of breakdown. Now, you said, Ruby, and, and I'll quote you, that Canada is recognized internationally uh, for its longstanding history of contributing to both military and civil operations, and that Canada is proud of its legacy in this public consultation. Um, how do we keep our peacekeepers safe when we're holding back our budget? Uh, we have an obligation to them to have the tools that they need to go forth and represent Canada. Uh, where do you stand on that? Absolutely. I have to agree with you that, you know, we need to look into uh, the tools, the proper tools that we need. So that's why 
uh, some of this budget has been held back so that we go forward buying the right equipment for our troops and not just because we're, you know, in, trapped in a contract of some sort mm -hmm. or, um, you know, have been with, you know, we're trying to put the politics aside right now and trying to figure out broaden our definitions, not be so narrow as to what we need. It's the reason we're doing these consultations as well. A, a great point about the military vests that uh, our men and armed, our men and women in our, the armed services wear was brought up. I got to wear the, uh, the yeah. vest and, you know, they pointed out several factors of why this could be uh, a hindrance to their survival on the ground and, you know, it may seem like a simple thing, but when you're out there and it's your, you know, the way to carry guns. equipment <laughs> and the way to carry your military equipment and your water and other things, you need to make sure that it's functioning properly and that it fits properly. So, I mean, that was one simple thing that they had pointed out to me, right. but you know, we could talk about our planes, uh, we can talk about a lot of other things that we do need to replace and the government has not said that they will not replace, but what they need to figure out is what they need to replace it with. Um, are we stuck in an idea of, you know, it needs to be replaced with this because that's what we've had or uh, could we be broadening our definition and that's what they're trying to do at this time and figure out what we will be purchasing purchasing in the future. So I agree, uh, you know, our, our planes, a lot of things do need to be replaced. They were bought back in the 80s and um, some have been repaired since that time. Well, the but Hornets, the helicopters, uh, the Halifax based ships. I mean, we have a lot of things uh, that we need to consider. If you look at some of the stats, interestingly, if 109,000 jobs are directly or indirectly uh, uh, affected by uh, the Canadian military. 12.6 billion is the industry revenue, 6.4 billion in revenue in exports, and 9 billion in the GDP, 250 billion in research and development. Uh, there's a lot of things. The government's committed 586 million currently set aside for promoting international peace, so that's our peacekeepers. And finally, 450 million for foreign affairs run. Um, it looks like um, your government is taking us into a larger peacekeeping role in the world. Uh, and many would say that that's a good thing. Others would say we need to be well equipped. Well, we need both. I mean, if you're heading into a peacekeeping role, you need to be equipped at the same time. You also, I mean, we have some of the best trained soldiers. Mm -hmm. That's why the need is there. The, you know, that's why the world needs more of Canada, as Obama put it. We have a military, uh, a minister of defense that's, you know, has been there on the ground and is well recognized and known for that, well respected for that reason. And I assure you, I mean, if there's one thing we ever discuss is that he wants to make sure that the men and women that go out there are well equipped, are, you know, continue to get the, you know, the training that they need and that we make, uh, you know, keep our international reputation that we've always had. And that is for peacekeeping. So I know that the Liberals are very, very interested in making sure that our peacekeeping role continues. Yeah. Um, um, well, the I, Prime Minister definitely stated that, and he stated that to the world when he went around. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at this, so let's just jump to another topic here. When you talk about uh, ISIS and the threat of uh, radical Islamic terrorism, uh, when you talk about uh, the internet, when you uh, uh, talk about the web, uh, you talk about a source of information and radicalization through modern terms. Um, is there not a, a policy Canada being uh, technologically advanced? I mean, they were, you know, Canadians sit inside because it's cold and they think a lot, as they say. Um, is there some movement currently to consider the web-based cyber element of, uh, of combating against this uh, this new terror from a Canadian position? Because that would be right in our bailiwick, would it not? Yeah, absolutely. And this was discussed around the round table. There are concerns about, uh, you know, are we integrated enough with all of our agencies, uh, whether it be CSIS or the RCMP or CBSA, you know, there was a talk about fly lists and, and technology and how we can improve mint improve it and the cyber threat that you're that you're talking about so I think integration is key uh, to solving some of these right. situations uh, however you know I've talked with people at the Canadian Space Agency that's something that you know yeah. has been lacking in years too and uh, something that you, you know to pump the Canada arm. we do we do and they're quite excited about this new government I've talked to you know uh, had the opportunity to go out on some projects here and and talk to some of their officials and you know for the first time they're saying you know our ideas are being listened to we're coming up with the presentations that have been put on hold for a very long time because we weren't thinking about a surveillance a, a, and a, a lot Canadian of other perspective. A Canadian perspective. And so, so with about a minute left, uh, the, the only time we hear the word NORAD is around Christmas time because you're tracking Santa Claus when he is mystically going across the north. With about a minute left, an important point was NORAD was uh, uh, part, Canada was part of NORAD with the United States. Now we've really come into our own where we can control our own destiny. Has there been any thought put to uh, 
um, Canadianizing NORAD and making sure that we control our destiny in our north and not dependent as much on the Americans? It goes back to making sure that our systems are up to par and that we have good um, communication amongst our own agencies here and we have good integration that I was talking about and we can contribute and we have been heavily in, mm -hmm. in NORAD. Uh, we train a lot of American forces, uh, you know, it's not something that's well known because Canadians are seen as, you know, the smaller smaller force when compared to America, yep. but we are good at what we do. So we are contributing to NORAD and we have have taken a different journey than the U.S. We have done that in the past. We saw that with, you know, Jean Chrétien's decision. It was a bold one at the time, but Canada uh, does stand up and make its own decisions. Yes, we do cooperate and work with the United States, yep. but we have a relationship with the United States that I feel is, um, you know, it's such a strong one that regardless of what uh, path we choose for ourselves, it's respected by yep. the United States and we'll continue doing that. Thank you for that. Uh, we're finished our discussion on military women. Come back with our final segment, our third segment. We're going to talk about the Canadian child care benefit, which was a, a huge announcement uh, as of late. And finally, a little bit about electoral reform. You're watching Brampton Focus. We're sitting here with Ruby Sahota, Brampton North, Minister of Par Member of Parliament. My name is Michael A. Sharp. I'm back with more right after this. Back to your Brampton Focus, our final segment with Miss Ruby Sahoda, who is a member of parliament for Brampton North. Our first two segments, we talked about the military, but now let's switch to stuff which a little more uh, personal, as one would say, and uh, represents what we want to talk about in Brampton. The, the child uh, care benefit uh, program was something that both yourself and many liberals and our, our current prime minister ran on. An important element to help families with children, those who are on the margins who can use this more than others, and eliminating those people who are making way too much money to receive this kind of a benefit because they don't need it. Um, some interesting developments and some good announcements happened in July and you were at the apex of that. Yes, we just had a, a media conference yesterday for the Peel MPs did to make sure that we raise the awareness about this Canada Child Benefit because a lot of people have been asking me whether their benefits are going to be cut, but right. no. Uh, you know, I want to let them know that they're going to get a, a simpler uh, check, a bigger check than they used to and a tax-free check. Check. So uh, starting this January, uh, July 20th, they're going to start rolling out. And uh, this is really going to help a lot of families in my riding and over the city of Brampton and the Peel area. Because, you know, poverty is one of those things that can be easily hidden. And uh, we have about 66,000 kids that live in poverty in Peel. We need to address this issue. And this Canada Child Benefit will help do that. It'll help raise 300,000 kids out of poverty. It will help 9 out of 10 families. That that's almost everybody. Uh, and those that don't apply, you know, in that within a family with children, they benefit also because you see the economy improving. Mm -hmm. When people have more money, they spend more money. And uh, that helps our local businesses. It helps people all around. Well, investing in children is investing in our future. One of the points that uh, was a hallmark of what the Liberals ran on with people who are making over a million dollars or over $300,000 were receiving child checks. And you're kind of like, no going, more checks Dude, to those millionaires. people don't need that kind of money. That money should be better put. Yeah. And I think you've done that. That must be a feeling of accomplishment to see what you ran on in October happening now. Absolutely. No more checks to millionaires. People who yeah. make over $200,000 will not be receiving this benefit. But those that are under under that, the middle class and uh, those that are trying, you know, working hard to join it, they will be benefiting right. from this and they'll see a lot more. You can go online, Google uh, Canada Child Benefit Calculator, put in your income, hit enter and you'll see what you'll yeah. receive a month. So that's positive news. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that uh, has been uh, quite a lot of discussion on is electoral reform. Uh, we talk about first past the post. You may know first past the post. Um, it, certain areas get more votes than others. It's not necessarily predicated on one person, one vote. That's what electoral uh, reform is looking at, is being able to say one person, one vote. How can a majority government rule a country when they got 48 or 46 percent of the vote, but maintain that they have uh, the majority. What are some of the things that are going to happen in this region in Brampton with regards to electoral reform? 
Well, uh, our government has promised that this past federal election would be the last election under the first past the post system. So we're very, very, uh, we're looking at an aggressive schedule, uh, but we're very committed into, you know, making this system more representative of, of our people, of Canadians. I sit on the Committee for Electoral Reform. It's a one of a kind committee. It's a special committee that's been created with 12 members rather than uh, the usual 10. It's got uh, the, you know, Elizabeth May, the Green Party leader. <coughs> There, it's got uh, the leader of the Bloc Quebecois present, and they both have voting rights you think as this well. Is any, any of the results of this is going to happen before the next election? Are we going to see this, or is it going to take too much time? Do you think? No, we uh, we had the chief electoral officer uh, present as a witness uh, just a few weeks ago, and he said it's quite possible as long as uh, he has some. Good direction by next right. May. And we'll be holding consultations. Now, that's all an across. important point. A lot of people in Canada want to have a voice to this. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would suspect, as it being one of your platforms, you're going to make a concerted effort to get as many public. Uh, positions and, and, and rallies as possible. So, right? so every MP will be doing consultations by October across the country. Our electoral reform committee is also set to travel across the country in September. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been taking expert testimony in Ottawa over the summer and con will continue to do so. My town hall personally will be later in the summer in August at some point. You can check my Facebook and Twitter for updates on that. We're trying to get the minister here present. You're also going to have somebody who sits on the committee. So uh, that's really important because there is some direct influence that we can have for the process. So I invite, you know, I urge everyone to come out and have their voice heard uh, when it comes to this important issue and how you'll be voting in your next federal election. You know, uh, Mr. Hoda, one of the things that is a hallmark of what you've been here and what we've seen is you're always in touch with your people, your website. Um, you, you take what they say, you conduct town halls. Um, so we appreciate you coming here to Brampton Focus. I want to give you an opportunity to speak to the folks at home um, and encourage them to interact with you because you really are a hands-on person and you listen to what they say. What what do you have to say to our folks at home? Absolutely. I just want to tell everybody uh, that, you know, you can come by to my office anytime. I'm around quite a lot in the summer and I make sure that I spend some most of my time, as much as I can, to listening to people. So it's at 50 Sunny Meadow and it's suite number 306. The phone number is 905-840-0505. Uh, please stay tuned to the town hall that's going to be coming up on electoral reform it's such an important issue we need to make sure that you know if if those that feel that they're not represented by the system that we change it in a way that you do feel your voice is heard so come take part uh, make sure you know you give your input and feedback because it's really going to be an important part of deciding which way uh, which direction Electoral our reform. elections take so we, we've just got under a minute left um, give us a give us a slice of what are you looking forward to in August and September you get to go back to the hill is there something really that you want to push or that you're looking forward to see go through? Is there one, one particular point? Uh, I, like I'm saying, you know, my summer is really focused around this electoral reform right. issue. Uh, I do a lot of immigration work in my office, so that's, you know, goes without saying that that's always something, you know, I'm learning from. Uh, I learn from people who have issues and how we can improve our system. But electoral reform is the main focus of my summer and going forward. Ruby Sahota, a member of parliament for Brampton North, coming here talking to us about the military electoral reform and, of course, the Canada Child Benefit uh, program, which is just being launched. We encourage you to go to Ruby's um, website because you can get all the information you need. If you have an interesting comment or something that you wish to share with us, raptedfocus.ca. My name is Michael A. Charbon. Thank you to Ruby Sahota and to you for watching. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks.